got an arsenal. Bring you up to speed with what you need. He's the local and nationwide news feed. Let's talk about it. Dialect to do something about it. Chip got the flow wide open if you got questions about it. Man, it's the show that brings you to your raw. To solve all problems, it starts with real talk. It's real talk. And here we go. Here we go on this Monday, the 28th day of March, 2022. This is Real Talk Memphis, and we are on the air. I am your humble host, Chip Washington. Very, very happy to have you with us uh, on this uh, last Monday in March. And yeah, the year is just flying by, absolutely flying by. So on this day, um, after the slap heard around the world. <laughs> we'll talk more about that <laughs> in just a couple of minutes. Uh, I hope that you had a good week since the last time we had a chance to uh, visit with one another. And I also hope uh, that uh, your Monday was good. You know, a lot of us, you know, Mondays for a lot of folks, eh, you know, we like Mondays. Do we like Mondays? How do we feel about Mondays for most people? Mondays are Mondays, but it was a beautiful day today. So I hope you enjoyed the fact that it was a beautiful day today because I'm to understand that Wednesday we're going to see more storms. But first things first, uh, we have a packed show for you tonight. I got a lot of news to get to tonight, so I'm going to jump right in. Now, if you uh, don't quite know all the ways to get this radio show, let's hit that. 91.7 on your FM dial. We are on live right now, WYXR. You can also catch us on the uh, WYXR app. Uh, the TuneIn app, you can catch us on that. And uh, we are also on Facebook Live as well as uh, YouTube. I'll be posting a bit later on uh, to YouTube. And we are a podcast, so you can also catch us tomorrow when they post the show wherever you get your podcast. And so, again, nice to have you all with us. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm hearing double on my phone here the volume was up but in any event uh as we move through the show we have a good show for you tonight a lot of information to pass forth uh some great guests and uh of course you know how we do it here we like to provide some uh, information and edification along with a bit of entertainment as well but before we move too far into the show let's get to birthdays and uh, we can't do that until i tell jack hit it jack Happy yes Last day of March, 2022. Happy birthday is going out to my longtime friend, Jacqueline McDonald in Jackson, Mississippi. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Linda Woodard. Tamika Perry. Happy birthday, Fabo Williams. Trevecca Steger. My cousin, Carlisha Rhodes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Lisa Skinner. Wendy Green Rogers' birthday is today. And that is the wife of uh, my barber and my friend, Carlos Rogers. So happy birthday uh, to the missus. I hope she had a wonderful day. I hope you treated her well on her birthday, Carlos. Uh, also, Michael Powell celebrating a birthday today. Now, uh, tomorrow, uh, singer, blues singer, Willie Clayton on the blues. He celebrates his birthday tomorrow. And on Wednesday, my very good friend and my former work wife at MLGW, Leela Garlington, celebrates her birthday on Wednesday. So to each and every one of you, a very, very happy birthday, happy upcoming birthday. And we hope to be with you a year from now to celebrate your another trip around the sun. Thanks, Jack. So um, as we move forward into uh, some of the special announcements, we had a couple of notable deaths uh, last uh, week or so. 
Madeleine Albright, who was the first female named the Secretary of State uh, in this country, uh, uh, died uh, last week at the age of 84 of cancer. And also um, gospel great LaShawn Pace, uh, acclaimed gospel vocalist uh, and songwriter, passed away. She was 60 years young, and she died of organ failure while on dialysis uh, while also waiting for a kidney. Uh, I know I've been changed. That's one of the biggest hits that she ever had. And I love that record. But anyway, rest in peace, uh, LaShawn Pace and uh, Madeline Albright. Uh, jumping into the news and notes. And man, I tell you what, a lot, 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 lot going on. Uh, many of you probably heard about the uh, very sad incident in Tunica, Mississippi. It happened last week, uh, last early Thursday morning when a 21-year-old woman broke into a house uh, one would assume it was probably an ex-relationship, uh, stabbed a woman that was in the house uh, to death. This happened about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, word has it that she worked at one of the casinos down in uh, Tunica, left there, came to this house, committed this crime, and went back to work. But anyway, she has been caught, arrested. Uh, the victim is identified as 21-year-old Brianna Jackson. Very sad, very, very sad story. Uh, beginning of this month, we had a, another shooting death, uh, this time on Beale Street near Riverside. You remember that? 15-year-old <clears throat> boy uh, and a 16-year-old girl were both shot, and the 15-year-old boy died of his injuries. Well, three people were arrested by the marshals uh, over the weekend for that particular crime. Three people. Two of them were 15 years old. The other one was 16 years old. Now, I'll just let that marinate for just a second. 15 and 16 year olds committing crimes, committing murder. Um, very uh, sad situation happened yesterday morning. Uh, they left a three year old dead after he accidentally shot himself uh, with an unsecured AR-15 assault rifle that was under a pile of clothes. Now. Three and four year olds are curious by nature. They are going to run and they're going to rummage and they're going to try to find whatever they can find. Um, extremely sad. Uh, the mother of the child and the man who owned the gun are both facing some very serious charges. I mean, this gun was left out. I mean, basically where this kid could find it. You know, unsecured, the mother and her friend left to go to the store. Uh, an uncle was supposed to be watching the three-year-old and his four-year-old brother. Uh, he fell asleep. He woke up when he heard the gunshot. And uh, by the time he got to the child, uh, it, it, it was too late. So extraordinarily sad, very, very sad situation. And once again, that same uh, thing we talk about all the time, guns, 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 just being left out, just with not a care in the world. You think that a child is not going to, uh, you know, find these things with children are curious. And they will go looking. By the way, you know, every week I try to, you know, have some breaking news for you. Um, have some breaking news that just, I just saw it literally a few minutes ago. Jarvis Greer, Jarvo, Action News 5 sports broadcasting legend, is hanging up his cleats after 43 years at the station. 43 years at WMC TV 5. Jarvis Greer is retiring. So that just leaves Joe Birch. I, we, we, we'll probably have to wheel Joe out. You know, he'll stay there as long as he can, <laughs> as he can continue to do the news. But uh, in any event, uh, man, great guy. Great, great guy. Uh, Jarvis Greer will definitely uh, be missed. That void will uh, definitely uh, you know, be open. So, you know, we have a big uh, kind of a housing problem situation here in Memphis. And um, to say that is kind of an understatement. So uh, the uh, Memphis Housing Authority last week uh, held uh, a pre-application process event. It was like a lottery, basically. And you had to, you had to apply uh, online for this uh, last week. Uh, it, it ended on Friday afternoon. Um, they said that they anticipated about 30 thousand applications uh, for uh, however many uh, uh, voucher positions that they had available. They said they would narrow the waiting list down to 10,000. And once uh, the uh, waiting list is closed, 
a random lottery process will be utilized to uh, select the 10,000 pre-applicants that will be placed on the new waiting list. Oh, and by the way, uh, I will have the executive director of the Memphis Housing Authority on this broadcast next Monday night. We'll talk all about this. Housing is a big, big issue uh, out here uh, in, uh, in our city and our county. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson looks like she is on her way to becoming the Associate Supreme Court Justice and the first Black female to ever hold that position. Uh, she's been grilled pretty good by the boys uh, in Congress. And uh, looks like that's uh, over. We'll, we'll probably get a vote in the next couple of weeks. And I think that uh, she will be confirmed. That's another history-making event. The BA2 variant of COVID uh, is starting to rumble its way across the country. Now, we, we still don't know. You know, we know it's more transmissible, supposedly. But um, how, how, how strong is it? Uh, will it cost hospitalizations? Will it cost, uh, uh, you know, additional deaths and things like that? Don't really know as of yet. We'll keep an eye on it. I'll keep an eye on it. And in the meantime, if you had not had the vaccination or your boosters, uh, you should go out and do that just to protect yourself. Many of you probably heard what happened uh, over the weekend regarding the University of Memphis basketball program and Penny Hardaway. The university is reportedly facing multiple level one and level two um, violations. According to the IARP, the uh, NCAA complex case unit is claiming that there's been a pattern of non-compliance within the Tigers program under Penny, and he failed to demonstrate that he promoted an atmosphere of compliance. Well, the University of Memphis is absolutely fighting this. Uh, they plan on fighting this tooth and nail. This could be a bad situation. I mean, you know, I don't know what the fallout could be, but level one violations are pretty serious in terms of the NCAA. So we'll have to wait and see how what more information comes out, how all of this plays out, and, you know, where we go from here. Your Memphis Grizzlies uh, are in the playoffs. They have officially... Uh, secured a spot in the uh, NBA playoffs in the next uh, couple, three weeks. Congratulations to them as uh, they continue to march forward. Now, before I go to break, we have to talk about the slap heard around the world. You didn't watch the Oscars last night. You didn't have to because, my God, it was, it's been all over the news. It's been everywhere. Um, Chris Rock came out to present an award for best documentary. Comics crack jokes, right? Comics crack jokes. He, he, so he cracked a joke uh, about uh, Jada um, Pickett, um, Will Smith's wife. He said something to the effect that, uh, yeah, you know, Jada, I love you, Jada uh, Pickett, and uh, looking forward to seeing, um, what's the name of that movie? The uh, G. Jane. Yeah, G.I. Jane 2. Yeah, because she has a shaved head because she's got alopecia. And so, you know, you got to laugh, right? And she, they showed her, Will was kind of chuckling about it, but they showed her face. She didn't look too pleased. Well, next thing you know, uh, husband Will got up, walked up to Chris Rock and just gave him the biggest slap in the face, uh, shocking everybody. I don't think it was planned. I don't think it was an event. I think it was, you know, he reacted. And Chris Rock, of course, was very stunned. And, uh, you know, and then also on his way back to the seat, uh, Will Smith uh, said that uh, Chris needed to keep his wife's name out of his mouth using an expletive deleted uh, to, uh, to express those thoughts. Shocked everybody, right? Everybody was shocked. Uh, I asked the question earlier, so what do you think about that? Was Will Smith wrong? You guys on Facebook Live right now, you can, hear, you can uh, express yourself on this. I'm curious to see, most of the comments I saw were, you know, that, that, that Will Smith was wrong in what he did. First of all, this is a global event. Second of all, you know, to walk up and slap somebody who, who, who cracks a joke, that's what comedians do. They crack jokes. So, you know, a lot of comedians are wondering now, so if I do what I do in my routine, right, and I crack a joke you know, to somebody in the audience, and they're going to come up and, because they don't like it, because I, I, I picked at them, they're going to come up and beat me up. So, you know, I don't know. At first, my reaction was, well, you know, maybe Will was right. But then I thought to myself, the, the other 
sane part of myself said, no, that was wrong. It was wrong what he did. And, uh, you know, there are ways to handle that. Now, whether they have resolved it or not, I don't know. Um, it would be good for Will Smith to come out and apologize uh, to Chris Rock for, for the actions that were taken. A lot, of, a lot of folks have a lot of opinions about this. So I'd be curious about what you all think as well. All right. So listen, we're going to stop it right there. We're going to go to break. When we come back, we are going to talk about an issue that has really been in the news and even nationally, uh, the issue that is going on in Mason, Tennessee, in reference to their finances and perhaps being taken over by the state. Our first guest is going to talk to us all about that. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am Chip. You know who you are. Quick break, right back. Okay, doctor, what's happening with you? Can you hear me, man? Sure. Antonio. Okay, here we go. I got you, man. I got you. Hold on a second. Okay. So listen, we're in commercial break, man. So I'll be right back with you, okay? Okay, cool deal. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. YXR HQ, Saturday, April 2nd, noon to 4 p.m. Meeting in the Middle is made possible with funds from Arts Memphis and Arts, Arts Built Community Grant. WYXR Stereo Sessions, presented by Nexair and Memphis, continues on with the Grifters 1994 Rock Opus LP, Crappin' You Negative. Sit and listen in the state-of-the-art Memphis Listening Lab as hosts Jimmy Inc. and Andrea Lyle press play on the pivotal local cult classic. The free event is made possible with a grant from Humanities Tennessee, along with support from Ryan, Memphis Listening Lab, Via Productions, Fat Possum Records, and Shangri-La Records. For more information, visit wyxr.org and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for RSVP announcements and updates. How's that shot, Chip? How's that shot? Cool. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this Monday evening. Very glad to have you along with us as I am my first guest. Now, I need to set this up a bit. Uh, many of us have heard about the situation in Selmer, Tennessee, a small town in Tipton County, uh, and they have uh, had some, some financial issues and, and, and some other issues, um, probably going back uh, several years. Uh, well, a lot of this has, 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 has come to light as the state com comptroller uh, had uh, stepped into this and, and looked at things and said, hey, you know, we, we, th this is so bad that we might need to take over um, the town. And uh, there was even some talk at one point about the town surrendering, surrendering its charter. Well, my first guest um, is a man of action for sure. Uh, State Representative Antonio Touche Parkinson uh, is on with me and he brokered a meeting uh, as the chairman of the Black Caucus between the comptroller and city officials in Selma. And Antonio, thanks for, for coming on the show and kind of walking us through this. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Mason, Tennessee uh, uh, is a predominantly uh, African-American uh, town and uh, their vice mayor, uh, Virginia Rivers, um, and the comptroller, you know, we've all been in communication with each other. And, you know, and, 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 
here's the thing, you know, there's there, first of all, by law, the comptroller can come in and begin to supervise the finances of any city that is whose finances have fallen on hard times. So by law, he has that power. Okay. Um, there's been a history of the comptroller coming in and supervising or basically uh, taking over um, uh, cities and counties uh, finances, you know, in past years. As a matter of fact, uh, Van Buren County is under the comptroller's uh, financial uh, supervision as we speak right now. So, so there's a history there uh, of the comptroller doing that, and it's happened on um, multiple occasions before now, before Mason, Tennessee. Also, you know, and so you know, the thing that the thing for me as as Black Caucus Chair, excuse me. <coughs> Uh, it was simply to uh, make sure that the, the communications channels were open and transparent and honest and forthright. So, and, and, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, so so in, before, <laughs> before you go on, a lot of folks um, were, were wondering about that, were questioning that. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in based, based on your conversations with both parties and having said what you said about the comptroller's role, um, a lot of folks are saying, is this a black white issue? Now I know the majority of the leadership in, in, in Selmer is black right now, but these these these, Mason, period, these these issues preceded this particular group. Am I correct in that? Right. Well, well, remember it's Mason, Mason, Tennessee. Right. Uh, not Sel not Selmer. Right. I'm sorry, Selmer. Right, Mason. Right, right, Mason. Right. Mason. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. 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 And so um, uh, you know, so um some, you know, it, it depends on how you look at it because <clears throat> Well, how do honestly, you look at it? How do you look well, at well, it? Well, let me let me preface though. Let me preface with why I'm saying it, because honestly, you know, the the letter that was initially served by the comptroller uh, was it was a, a bit aggressive, right? And it asked them to to uh, give up their charter or you know be taken over by the comptroller's office. And and what and so there's a lot of there's a lot of of gray area in it. So one thing, the, the best thing, number one, for sure, is that they didn't give up their, their uh, charter. Mm -hmm. And so they, they still are the city of Mason and not an unincorporated part of Tipton County. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Secondly, you know, that narrative took off also because of the, the takeover language, right? And so it's not that the, the comptroller is not gonna come in and become the mayor of the city or, or, or take over a city. What happens is, they take over the supervision of the finances in order to get the, the budgets back to a balanced state and create some stability financially for the cities. And so, and that's temporary. That is not, you know, a, 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 a situation that will continue on and on and on and on forever. It's, it's temporary. And so what, what, what it, it, looking at it as a black and white issue, I think it's more of a, of a fiscal issue than it is a black and white issue because there's been a track record of the comptroller doing this uh, in previous times. And, and as far as I know, this is the first time that a black city or, or a black grand city has been in this situation. And so, like I said, right, even right now, uh, Van Buren County is under the comptroller's uh, supervision financially, and it's not a, it's not a black city. If you're just joining us, ladies and gentlemen, we are speaking with uh, Antonio Parkinson, state representative from Memphis, uh, chairman of the Black uh, Tennessee Black Caucus. We're talking about the situation in Mason, Tennessee, uh, that many of us have heard about, and it's made national news. So I wanted to get some clarity. I talked to Antonio offline last week about all this, and uh, before I found out that he was actually sitting down with both sides. Now, now Antonio, a lot of this, um, uh, does any of this hinge on uh any type of participation or role in the new Ford plant that is literally five minutes from uh the town of Mason. I mean are there ramifications right. in reference to, to, to that in terms right. of this situation? Well well yes again my answer is yes and no. And so let, let me let me qualify it though. So so um number one we know that the Ford plant and Blue Oval City and everything that's coming with it is coming to you know to that area. I think it's maybe 15 miles from Mason. At, I think max, and so so we know there's an opportunity for there to be a huge benefit to Mason, right? When they, when these when these entities are put in place, right? However, you know Mason has to be in a position to be fluid, 
right? And in a position to where, you know, um, you know, they can be where where they they can uh, where money can be brought into Mason or 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 where some where a bank a banking institution or or the city of Mason itself could float bonds and bring money in for infrastructure issues and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right now, that's not the case, right? And so once they come out of that supervision with the, with the comptroller, their their fiscal issues will be fixed and they will be in position to be able to benefit from the Ford deal, if that makes any sense. It does. Right. And so I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, one of the things that, that was that was brought to my attention in all of this is the fact that, that Mason doesn't have a grocery store. And it, it was told to me the reason that they don't have a grocery store is because their sewer lines are not big enough to hold a box, a box store like that, at this, that, 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 that commercial type of space. Right. And so in order to 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 improve on the, the, the capital issues that that this town may have, they have to be bankable. So they have to be able to um, be able to receive monies in forms of uh, floating bonds or whatever it is that how they, however they bring money into the city to expand their their uh, capital improvement projects. And tell and you so, about, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fish. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. And so and so and and and, and you know I, in in regards to timing, you know, it, it, you know this is this this could be seen as the best time to get the money in order, get their finances in order, because a few years down the road is when when Ford plant and all of this stuff will be up and running. And right. you want to be in place to be able to receive when this stuff starts happening. Well, you know, um, this is uh, this is kind of one of those uh, things that, you know, we really don't hear about. But but before I let you go, because I know you're at the legislature and you have the state business to take care of. Um, I, I'm to understand that there's a tentative, you know, agreement in terms of moving forward. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Yeah. And so, and so that's why that's why why I was saying the key the key has been the ability to communicate and to communicate openly, communicate transparently, and in truth. Right. And right. so, one thing that was happening was Mason was already trying to get their the the mayors of Mason were already trying to get their books in order before this happened. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when this happened. Uh, you know, the comptroller had a, a plan or a spending plan that he was putting together. And, and my conversations with, with the mayor of, of, or the vice mayor of Mason is, okay, you come with your plan, right? You ask him for all of the numbers in, in regards to what he sees as um, needing to be fixed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you have your team look at it, right? And, and also to the comptroller, get us a fact sheet of what this means when, when the comptroller comes in and takes over supervision of, of finances, give us a time, give them a timeline, not us, but give them a timeline. Well, they gave it to us too, though. Give them a timeline as to what your expected timeline is, how long you're gonna be supervising their finances and what the expected outcome is. And now that when, when Mason gets this stuff and when well, they got it and they're armed with this information, now they also can, can say, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Comptroller, we did here I, we see your plan, but here's our idea of how we can do this and and get that to him, right? And then y'all work together to make it happen. And that is exactly what has happened. And so Mason, uh, the city of Mason came uh, came up with the idea of taking their federal ARP funds, I think it was two hundred fifty six million dollars, and putting it towards that debt of of you know the five hundred thousand dollars that they were under. And so that knocked it, knocked half of it down, and that shortened the the time frame, the window immensely. And not to not to mention, there's another round of ARP funds that are coming to Mason, and that may knock the whole thing out. And yeah. so, and so, but it was a matter of, you know, just ensuring communication yeah. and and transparency and open dialogue, right? And 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 I think this was the most important part was making sure that everybody cut through the noise, right? Because there, there's a lot of, there were a lot of, you know, uh, things at play and narratives at play sure, sure, that yeah. didn't necessarily encompass what was factual. And so, and then when, when that was happening, you, 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 emotions start coming into play. People start, you know, taking sides right. and becoming defensive with each other sure. because, you know, what's out there in the media and, you know, on saying, hey, you know, they're trying to take the black folk city and then, you know, what's what's out there in the media about the control or control trying to take our city. 
right? And 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 if you now that you know factually, the comptroller can't take a city. He can supervise your finances yeah. by law. Yeah. You're right, and and by law, that's what that's what he is supposed to do, right? To make sure that all cities in Tennessee have a balanced budget and that they are not uh, operating on funds that were actually for another purpose. Listen, Antonio, thank you so much, man, for, for coming on the show. I know how busy you are. And, and so sort of giving, putting the light on this, kind of giving us some clarity about this situation. We'll all be watching it very carefully. And as the time moves forward, maybe we can get you back, talk a little bit more about all this. Right. And let me, let me say this last thing too. I think it's important to note that Mason didn't get in this trouble, get in this situation overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, Mason just started, even though they were predominantly black city, just began to have black leadership in, in the last four years. Okay. The, the, the situation started 16 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, under the white leadership, all the way up until about four years ago when the first black mayor was was elected in, in the city of Mason, in town of Mason. So, so it didn't just start, it didn't start with them, uh, but they were tasked with cleaning it up. So I think that's important for people to know too. Absolutely that. Uh, State Representative uh, Antonio Touche Parkinson, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again down the road. You be safe out there, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Y'all take care, man. Appreciate it. Take care. Yes, sir. Well, that was a very enlightening conversation and um, we'll keep an eye on it. Absolutely that uh, as uh, time moves forward. We're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about something a little closer to home uh, with uh, the man who runs Habitat for Humanity. They got a big financial gift not too long ago, and we'll talk all about that. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip, and we will be right back. Hey, Dwayne. Oh, hey, Dwayne, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Man, I'm doing fantastic. Listen, thanks for being on the show tonight. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're in commercial break. And uh, when we come back, you and I are going to chat. Are you going to, are you, are we going to see your face? <laughs> you know what? I'm trying to hit the start video and nothing's okay. happening. It says oh. start video. Oh, okay. Well, I'll let you deal with that. But we're in commercial break, but I'll be with you in a couple, just about another minute or so, okay? Okay, sure. Yes, sir. Thanks. Stand by. Um. Orion believes communities work best when they work together. They have been a trusted financial partner in our community for more than 60 years and are committed to giving back in the neighborhoods they serve. You can see how they're redefining banking at orionfcu.com. This is Stephen Tate, head brewer at Crosstown Brewing Company. It's my pleasure to design and give life to the tasty beers our customers love so much. Crosstown Concourse is a unique environment and the programming at WYXR reflects the very same independent spirit and ethos that makes our beer special. Cheers to Memphis and great community radio. Enjoy. If you weren't so impatient. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And this is Real Talk Memphis uh, for this Monday, the 28th day of March, the last Monday in March. Very happy to have you with us and very happy to have my next guest. He's never been on this show before, but the Habitat for Humanity is an organization that all of us know, and uh, particularly about the fine works that they do uh, to help uh, create ownership for so many out there in need. Well, recently... Habitat for Humanity International and 83 Habitat affiliates received a $436 million gift from author and philanthropist Mackenzie Scott. 
of that $436 million to Humanity International, uh, our local chapter here uh, got $7.5 million. And I'm very, very happy to have the president and CEO of uh, Habitat uh, Memphis. Uh, his name is Dwayne Spencer. And Dwayne, thank you for uh, coming on Real Talk. Really glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. So um, this obviously um, is a very huge gift and uh, nice to be able to fill the coffers with this. 7.5 million. I guess I should start by by asking you how you all find found out about this and uh, yeah, particularly the amount that you received. Yeah, it, in the typical McKinsey Scott fashion, uh, it was <laughs> low key and non-disclosure agreements to not talk about it. But I will tell you, I was saying to um, a couple of friends one day on a Wednesday, wow, McKinsey's giving all this money away. I wish that Habitat was on her radar. And literally the next day, uh, I received um, this odd email from the West Coast from someone that said that they were representing an anonymous donor. And I thought, could this really be it? <laughs> and, and it was, it was. Uh, it, so um, we had a phone call um, a couple of days later and uh, the person said, I'm, I'm representing Mackenzie Scott. Uh, we're gonna start with economics and you're receiving a $7.5 million uh, gift. So, Absolutely amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yes. And, 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 I, and I tell you, uh, you know, you all do some amazing work, you know, Dwayne, uh, and, and uh, there are so many people in need. Uh, there are so many folks in need um, and housing seems to be a very big issue, uh, you know, these days, particularly here in Memphis and, and, and Shelby County. And uh, I guess, would it be fair to say, uh, to ask you, um, are there really as ch challenging situations or are the challenge are situations as challenging as, as, as we, we, we perceive them to be? They definitely are. Uh, and certainly the pandemic has, has impacted that. Um, but I'll tell you, some of the latest statistics say that um, average rent has increased about 19 or 20 percent since 2021. Right. That's huge. And then the other thing that we find, because we're all about home ownership, and we make that happen by not charging interest. I want to make sure that people know that we build the house and then we sell it to the borrower. Right. Zero percent interest. There's absolutely no giveaway. A lot of people think that we do that. Um, but the folks coming to us are generally spending maybe 40 to 50 percent of their bring home pay on housing. And our goal, uh, Chip, is to get it back down to about 30 percent, which is where it should be for most of us. Is, 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 uh, what is the end result of that? I mean, why, I mean, you know, this is kind of your field. Uh, yeah. what, what, when, when you, when you see those type of numbers and, uh, COVID and whatever else exacerbates, uh, the fact that people have to pay so much more to keep a roof over their heads. I mean, I mean, what, what are we to make of that? Well, it is the market. It is what's happening today. And the, the cost of construction um, is, is one of those things. It's all about what the market will bear. Um, unfortunately, the families that we serve are uh, low to moderate income. So uh, that means that their incomes, their bring home pay does not keep up with the market. You know, so um, they are seeing, they're paying about you know, 800 to $900 um, for a three bedroom apartment. And many times they're not even in good condition. And what we can do through our program is get that down to more like six to $650. And it's home ownership. I mean, it's gonna be an asset that yeah. they can pass off to their children, their grandchildren. And, and, and also it helps them to be stable and not move from rental unit to rental unit. We're speaking with Dwayne Spencer. He is the president and CEO of uh, Habitat uh, Memphis. And we're talking about the $7.5 million gift uh, that he and his organization received. Now, two things, um, uh, Dwayne. First of all, how do folks qualify to, uh, to uh, participate in the Habitat uh, you know, House Build Program? And then I wanna ask you about your strategic plan moving forward. Yeah, so um, our folks qualify via a, a few things. First mm -hmm. is uh, the need. Um, which means they have a qualifying need. Either they are um, homeless because they're living with, with a relative or someone else, 
um, or they are overcrowded, or they're spending just way too much of their bring home pay on housing, as I mentioned before. Right. Um, then they have to have uh, the willingness to partner. And that means that they will sit through and learn and listen as we do financial literacy and education mm. over you know, a three to four month period. And they're going to participate in that. They'll also probably go out to the build site and, and hammer on a house um, next to a corporate donor. But then the other thing is that they have the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that through our underwriting, which is non-traditional, um, we don't put a lot of stock into credit scores and things like that, but they have to have the ability to pay the mortgage and have stable income, uh, which generally comes from having, having a stable job, mm -hmm. be able to, to, to make the mortgage payment. And I will tell you, that 600 to 650 is more than it used to be. When I got here 20 years ago, the mortgages were more like 325. Yeah. And so things have changed and they have to be stable and able to afford that. We want to set them up for success. Is there a, is there a number um, in, in terms of as you start your, your fiscal year and you can sort of look down the calendar as to how many homes uh, you all build in a particular calendar year? Yeah, that definitely fluctuates year by year. Uh, sure. Here, uh, we're doing 27 houses. Last year, we did 27. And as we move into 2023, which is our 40th anniversary. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, our goal is to step it up. And um, uh, we're raising money right now to um, build 45 houses in this next year. And that'll be the most we've ever um, built in any one year. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it, it really is. Okay, so now, now that you've got this this this, this uh, big gift, yes. uh, I, I, now, now you, I'm sure you're sitting around and your team and you're, you're looking at this and you're trying to figure out your strategic plan moving forward um, as, as pertains to, uh, to, that, to that gift. And have you, have you started that? I know this is, I know you just got this, but, but I'm sure you're, you're a man who's always thinking, you're always kind of, you have to be forward thinking. You have to look ahead and see, it looks like like down the road and, and what does this what does this gift do for that vision you know uh chip we had started strategic planning already we've hired a consultant um we pretty much achieved everything we wanted to in the last plan okay we realized that it was time to um, pull it off the shelf dust it off and start looking five to seven years um into the future uh -huh. taking into consideration um, the economics of today, the cost of land and lots, the cost to build the homes, um, and the fact that homeowners are having come off of more money per month just to afford, you know, the mortgage. Sure. So this 7.5 million gives us a head start um, in, in the plan that um, we hope will take us into the next five to seven years. And so we can think a little more um, um, boldly um, about some things that we probably would not have uh, prioritized before, mm -hmm. we can step a little bit outside of the, the general uh, concepts that we were looking at prior to this. Well, I tell you what, man, I, I am, I am, I'm a big fan of, of, of the Habitat organization. When I was in Jackson, Mississippi, I uh, worked for a yeah. college, we actually built a house, a Habitat house uh, back, awesome. back, back in the day. And I got to be honest with you, that was one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. Watching a, a, a homeowner, uh, it was a woman at the time with a with a with a the three year old daughter, uh, you know, helping to build a house and giving them the keys to a new home uh, presented to them by the Habitat organization. You, yeah, they just can't. I mean, honestly, you, I mean, there's there's not too much uh, better than that as far as I'm concerned. Well, you said it best. I mean, an affordable home yes provides a foundation for families. I mean, it absolutely does. And what Mackenzie Scott has done for us is basically invest in our work. And this is gonna be a jumping off point um, for our future. Um, our goal is to let this uh, catapult us forward um, in a much more meaningful and impactful future. Dwayne Spencer, president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Memphis. Congratulations on, uh, on, on, the, on the gift and uh, congratulations and thank you for all you do. Uh, to help our community uh, better itself and give uh, so many folks uh, the opportunity uh, for home ownership. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chip, for letting me share. Yes, sir. Thank you very much.
Dwayne Spencer, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, that's uh, that is one uh, heck of an organization, and he has uh, done a tremendous job leading it. And now, with seven point five million additional dollars in the coffer, watch them go to work. Now we're going to take our final break, and when we come back, we are going to uh, talk to a man who has committed himself to the youth of our city, uh, raising boys into successful men. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. Quick break. Right back. Curtis, Curtis, Curtis. How are you, sir? Curtis, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. How are you, man? <laughs> man, I'm doing great. So listen, we're in commercial break. When we come back, it's going to be me and you in just a minute, okay? All right, then. Just stand by. All right, thank you. Page, and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. The University of Memphis is proud to be a founding partner of WYXR. They have recently been named an R1 institution by the Carnegie Classification of Institutions of Higher Education, putting the U of M in the top tier of research universities nationally. This milestone solidifies the university as one of the two flagship public institutions in Tennessee. More information at memphis.edu. The University of Memphis is proud to be a founding partner of WYXR. They've recently been named an R1 institution by the Carnegie Classification of Institutions of Higher Education, putting the U of M in the top tier of research universities nationally. This milestone solidifies the university as one of two flagship public institutions in Tennessee. More information at memphis.edu. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to the big broadcast of this Monday. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit at the top of the show. We gave some uh, some rather sto- sobering statistics involving young people uh, and, and, and what is going on out in our communities and in our streets. Well, my next guest is a man um, who is the founder and director of an organization called Brotherhood Boys to Men uh, because he cares a lot about these young folks and he wants them uh, – not to be statistics, but to be successful young men and eventually be the leaders of our community. Uh, very pleased to welcome to the show, Curtis Weathers, as I said, founder and director of Brotherhood Boys to Men. And Curtis, thanks for coming on the show, man. Really glad to have yeah. you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely that. So, you know, tell us, uh, the, the folks uh, who may not know a little bit about your organization and what it is that you have dedicated to do with these young folks. Yeah, the Brotherhood uh, is, uh, well, the Brotherhood, um, we call it Brotherhood B2M, Boys to Men, uh, Mm -hmm. is, uh, we like to think of ourselves as a fraternal organization for teenage boys. And, you know, several, uh, well, a few years ago, uh, I retired as a school principal. And um, we always had, you know, some type of organization in our school that was that was focused on young boys. We, we called it boys to men, we call it other kinds of names, but you know, there, there was always a group of kids in our school that you know, just didn't have anything to belong to. Mm-hmm. And you know, athletes have their own fraternity and, you know, and they, you know, they, they kick it with each other and, you know, and they have relationships. But there, there, again, there was always that other group of kids that just didn't have anything belong to. And so I, I thought it was always a good idea to have something for uh, for that group. When I retired uh, a few years ago, a couple uh, about three years ago now, um, you know, I got a little bored quickly and, sure. you know, missed the kids and and then but I thought, you know, to myself, you know, this is a great opportunity to 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 do the boys to men program permanently. So 
so we, you know, we, we shaped it into a nonprofit, uh, you know, developed a, a program of focused and, um, uh, and so we came up with, uh, with boys to men, our, our, our primary focus is personal leadership development. Uh, we teach our kids how to, you know, do a lot of things, but mainly centered around personal development. And, you know, our kids, uh, our boys, especially are, incredibly needy, uh, but they also need skills and, and need to know how to develop themselves uh, as a man. And, and that's what we try and provide. We have, right now we have four chapters uh, in, uh, uh, out there. When we started, we actually got started in 2019. Man, we got off to a great start. Mm -hmm. we, we ended up the year with, uh, or at least before the pandemic came, we had about nine chapters. We had about 170 members. Um, and then the pandemic came along and, uh, you know, squashed all that momentum. Yeah. And, uh, and so we've been recovering uh, ever since. We decided to uh, launch again uh, this past school year. Uh, but, you know, we decided not to grow as fast because you know, managing nine schools and with one person was kind of difficult, but my board has helped me, stepped in, picked up some of the schools, and uh, uh, and so we're off and running and off to a great start uh, right now. We have about 80 members right now, and... Uh, yeah, Man, that sounds that sounds really, that, that sounds really, really good, and I, I know uh, probably within the last um, month or two, you know, I saw you and your program highlighted on uh, on uh, several uh, television uh, news uh, programs about the good work that you're doing with these young men. What what is it that when you when you watch these uh, when you watch these young guys when they come in the program, how are they, and the evolution of growth that you see um, as they go through the program? Yeah, that's a that, that's a good question because that that varies. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of times I'm going to give you a couple of examples, you know, when, um, you know, the things that we teach with, as regards to personal leadership development are, are things that, you know, they, they kind of see every day, but nobody has ever engaged them in those kinds of things like goal setting and, you know, and, and actually thinking about the, the careers that they want at this particular age and actually being serious about that as well. Sure. But we have six principles that we that we that we teach them about things like integrity and, and perseverance and, and commitment and scholarship and and all of those things. And, and 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 we grade them by that. In other words, you know, they know all the time that I'm watching them, everything that they do. We try and have uh, an event every month, some type of activity that involves all of our chapters uh, throughout you know, throughout, uh, throughout Memphis, we have Saturday sessions on every weekend. Uh, and so all of that exposure to all of the things that we do are, are, are changing them. I, I, I was telling a group of people I posted on, on Facebook, uh, the other day, we, we had an overnight trip, uh, a couple of weeks ago to Nashville. Mm -hmm. It was our first college tour. And so we visited about four or five colleges, uh, along with some other uh, other sites in in, uh, in Nashville, but my statement to, to to the public was, you'd be surprised at the conversation driving down uh, or up to Nashville compared to the conversation on the bus coming back from Nashville. Okay, it's amazing the difference exposure um, makes uh, in a child's life when they. <laughs> When all of a sudden they see the things that we've been talking about as it relates to college and they and they're, you know, and 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 they see opportunities, you know, their whole perspective uh, changes. And so that transition and that that dynamic happens a lot, you know, as kids learn the things we try and teach them as it relates to those principles. And, of course, uh, the activities that we do every every day and every weekend. Well, you know, when I was, uh, you know, kind of reading up about you and, and I saw what you did and you're, you're, uh, you're a professional, you're an ex uh, pro football player. So discipline, you know, has, it plays, it plays a big role in all of this, but more importantly, kind of what you just said about 
really the perspective that these young these these young men get from from being exposed uh, to to you all as responsible adults and 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 to each other, and they can help each other grow. Um, it, it seems to me in this program. Oh yeah, they 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 that happens all the time. You know, we we have what we call Saturday sessions. Uh huh. Um, now every week I, I visit all of our schools, uh, and we have, you know, we, we, we have lessons planned and so forth and so on. And so they, you know, I get a chance to talk to them at their individual schools on Saturday though, they get a chance to come together. So we have, we have members coming together from various schools and, and parts of, of the community, you know, and, uh, you know, we have schools from North Memphis to South Memphis. And they get a chance to interact with each other, and the right. and the whole purpose of Saturdays is exactly that to build that that brotherhood, you know, that camaraderie that they uh, that they experience. And so, as they learn stuff, and as they you know, and as they engage each other, you'd be surprised at you know the change of attitude that you see, uh, you know, in these guys. You know, they you know all of a sudden you know they understand what we mean by commitment. You know, some of them, you know, won't miss a Saturday. You know, that's that's a big deal for them to, you know, to to make a commitment like that and to be a part of what we're trying to do uh, on uh, on Saturday. So they're learning things every day, um, at, well, at least every time, you know, we get together because we're teaching them different things. And now sometimes, you know, sometimes you're going to get disappointment, man, when you're dealing with kids. They are very needy, uh, especially teenage boys. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they try and hold up to the principles that we that we have established for them. Well, listen, man, I, I, I just, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for everything that you're doing uh, to to help these young these young folks um, better themselves and uh, in doing so, making the communities better. I really appreciate having you on the show, and uh, I would like to keep up with you as uh, time moves forward. And if there's any uh, special programs or other events or activities or initiatives that you have, you're always welcome back on Real Talk, man. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, man. All right, appreciate you, man. Thanks. All right. Take care of yourself. All right, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to put the wraps on another edition of Real Talk Memphis. That was a great way to end it. Curtis Weathers is doing a tremendous job with these young folks, and congratulations to him and the Brotherhood B2M, or Boys to Men. Thanks to all my guests tonight, Antonio uh, TNT Parkinson, uh, Touche Parkinson, rather, and uh, Dwayne Spencer, President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity, for another engaging hour, and as Jack plays us out, Listen, I uh, created a fan page for this show last week. It's called Real Talk Memphis Radio Fans, whatever it is. Uh, anyway, go on Facebook and find it and, and become a member. You know, we have 132 members as of uh, tonight after about seven days. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just a page uh, dedicated to the show. Uh, Real Talk Memphis radio show fans page go to it on facebook go to it now go to it later and just join the family okay because you know we're a good group of people anyway thank you all for being with us tonight really appreciate it and if the lord says so we'll be back here at the same time same station the same seat but we'll try to do things just a little bit better will smith bad play last night with slap bad play that's all I'll say about that. So for Jack, for Lola, and for Nicole, I'm Chip, and I'm out. <laughs>